In the last video, we saw that if the system is in an eigenstate of the operator, then when we make a measurement of the quantity associated with that operator, be it momentum, energy, position, then what we get back is the eigenvalue associated with that operator in that eigenstate. So then the question is, if we have a superposition of states, what is the value of energy we get? And that is where the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics again rears its ugly head. So let's go up a few orders of magnitude. Let's zoom out instead of thinking about particles and electrons and atoms and molecules. Let's go up to the big bad macroscopic world and think about probability theory. So we've got a probability distribution associated with, let's say, heights, the heights of the class, for example, the heights of the various people in the class. So we can write down the average height or the expectation value for height, which we're going to write like that, in terms of, well, whatever the minimum height is, up to the maximum height. And what will it be? Well, it'll be the height multiplied by the probability of the height, and we integrate up. And that integral will give us the average value of height. Go back to quantitative physics last year. If that's not making sense, you did you looked at probability there, but perhaps we'll that's that's for a continuous function. Let's think about a discrete function. Think about some dice. Die, dice. Yeah, dice is the plural. Die is the singular. And this is a discrete um, probability function in that we can get one, two, three, four, five, six. So what we'd have for our expectation in that case is not a continuous um, distribution like this. We're going to have a discrete distribution. Why am I talking about discrete distributions? Well, remember, in terms of the particle in a box, our energies are quantized. They're not continuous. That's a discrete um, function in terms of the energy. We don't have a continuous um, range of energies. We don't have any available energy. We have a very discrete set of energy levels. So our dice are, are pretty important in this context. Now, we can have also continuous variables, but we can have both discrete and continuous. So, let's say this is the roll of a dice. What's the expectation value for the value we get on the roll of the dice? So, instead of having an integral, we'll have a sum. And this will run from, oh, what we call it, n equal to 1 to n equal to 6. And then we've got a value for a roll of our dice by the probability of that particular value. What we have, well, you know what's going to happen. We get, what's the probability? Well, assuming it's a fairly loaded dice, then we've got a sixth of um, for every value. So we'll have, follow this through with me, sixth plus a third plus a half plus two thirds plus five sixths plus one. Make sure you can see where that comes from. We're just taking the roll of the dice, we're taking a probability of one sixth each time for each number that can appear. Can we see that? Uh, let's, let's move it a little bit. There we go. Which is equal to, oh, uh, let's see, one sixth plus five sixths gives us one. One third plus two thirds gives us one and a one at the end, and a half is equal to 3.5. So our expectation value, in terms of the number we should expect, the average number we should expect in the roll of the dice, it might seem a little bit strange that it's not an integer, but that's how these things work out, is 3.5. Similarly, we can have a similar, when it comes to the um, expectation value for our energy, we have discrete energy levels, and we have a certain probability associated with each one of those energy levels. Where does that probability come from? Well, 
We'll not quite answer that question, but we'll certainly show mathematically the, the underpinnings of just where that um, probability distribution comes from. So how does this translate, this distribution translate to the quantum world? Quantum world's all about probability as well. Here's our probability distribution in terms of two very macroscopic things. We're not working with any, you know, we're not, it's not a dramatically different form of probability. When we get down there, it's the same probabilistic ideas and the same probabilistic reasoning. So instead of having this in terms of heights, we're going to remember that our probability density is given by the wave function multiplied by its complex conjugate, which gives us the modulus squared. So our expectation value associated with an operator, and this works for any operator, so I'll just call it O hat, is given by this. dependencies in. Quite why, does, why, have, why have we sandwiched the operator between um, the complex conjugate and the um, wave function itself just like that? Bear with me. Just bear with me. Um, take this as an article of faith. I hate to say that just for the moment. Later on we'll see just why this is the case. Actually, we'll see one reason why it's the case soon. And then later on, when we come to emission operators in the next video, that will help you understand why we've sandwiched the operator like that. But our psi star by our psi gives us a probability density. So we've got something that's related to probability there. And then we've got this quantity. And therefore, this is rather akin to what we had in terms of our height, our quantity, multiplied by our probability, and we integrate up to get our expectation value. It's the same general idea. And the other aspect of this is that we're assuming our, our wave functions are normalized. If they're not normalized, we'd have to divide through by, by that quantity. So how do we interpret this quantum mechanically? Well, what we need to do in terms of the probabilistic interpretation here is imagine we set up a very large number of systems, identical systems. We measure our observable O associated with this operator on each one of those systems. We get a, get a value for this one, we get a value for this one, we get a value for this one, we get a value for this one, O1, O2, O3, O. What this will represent, our expectation value, is the average value for those measurements on those identical systems. So in the last video, maybe the one before, that when the system is in an eigenstate of the operator, so an eigenstate in this case of, of this operator, then when we make a measurement, we will get the eigenvalue associated with that eigenstate in the operator with absolute certainty every single time. We can put that on a firm of mathematical footing now. Okay, let's just assume that this is um, normalized. So our wave functions are normalized. And what we're saying is that when our operator operates on our state, it returns our eigenvalue associated with that eigenstate, and it returns that with absolute certainty. So that would mean our expectation value. Let's have a look at what our expectation value, what this means in terms of our expectation value. So got this. So that means that we can, if our system is in this eigenstate, then we can write our expectation value as psi n star Okay, but that from here is just that, which means that can we see that? Yeah, okay, which means that we've got our eigenvalue associated with that eigenstate which we can take out because that's just a constant, times this. But this, because our 
eigenstates or wave functions are normalized, that just becomes 1, which means that our expectation value for that operator is just the eigenvalue. Notice there's no spread of values, there's no um, deltas associated here, it's just that eigenvalue. So in the notes, I ask you to calculate the variance associated with this measurement or the variance associated with um, the system, the, the values that we measure when the system is in the eigenstate. And we find out that the variance, which is the measure of the um, square of the standard deviation in terms of the measurements, we find out that the variance is, as we'd expect if we're claiming absolute certainty, is zero. So there isn't any spread in values in this particular case. We just get that eigenvalue with absolute certainty. But what happens now if our system is in a superposition of states? Okay, so our system is in a state which is in some superposition of our eigenfunctions associated with the operator. So our expectation value, as we have before, Okay, so we can write this, we can either have n's or m's, so let's write it as, let's make this a sum over m. And let's write this just exactly as we have there. And we integral integral over x. Okay, these are constants. These are constants. Complex valued, but constant nonetheless. So this is a sum over those constants, this is a sum over those constants. So that means we can still take that out. Cn star, uh, sum over n, Cn. And then let's write what we've got left, which is infinity psi m star by operating on psi n dx. But this is our operator on our eigenstate, which we know gives back our eigenvalue associated with that eigenstate. So that means we can write this as this will just be O n times our, our eigenstate, which has an x dependent, so that's staying in there. And then what we have is that. So we've got some sum of constants, some sum of constants, our eigenvalue times this integral. Now this integral is rather neat because this integral as our functions, as our eigenfunctions, as our basis functions, are orthogonal. That means that if m is equal to n, then that's equal to 1, because our, our, we've also said that our um, wave functions are normalized. So orthogonal and normalized, therefore orthonormal. If m isn't equal to n, then that's equal to 0, and everything vanishes. So. That means our m's here becomes n's because only when m is equal to n is that going to be 1. So we're nearly there. That means we have, just moving this up, is equal to n c n star n c n. O n, and that's one. It's zero for everything else for when m isn't equal to n, and it's one when m is equal to n. We've set m is equal to n, so what we have, well, that's a summation, this is summation over the same index. Which is equal to, Remember what we're actually letting this equal to, it's the expectation value for our operator. 
Remember, this is the expectation value for our operator when we apply that operator to make a measurement of the observable associated with that operator on our system when our system is not in an eigenfunction of the operator but is in a superposition of states. Okay, I had to concentrate to get that, that long sentence out, but I hope you get the idea. And what does it tell us? It tells us that actually what we're going to get is something which is um, related to the coefficients within our superposition. So just as, we had, as you saw in the last video towards the end, the C1, the C2, C3, where we're mixing those different um, eigenfunctions, the mixture of those or the amount of each one of those eigenstates in the superposition is going to tell us about, well, what is it going to tell us? It's going to tell us something related to the eigenvalues associated with that, we should expect the coefficient, the modulus of the coefficient squared times that, but what does that, what, what, what does that mean? Physically, what does that mean? If we go back to the roll of our dice, remember that we had for the roll of the dice, for the expectation value for the roll, let's call it R, roll of the dice, and we did that over N, n ran from 1 to 6, then our value of roll of the dice, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, times the probability, that's in that case is 1 sixth. But notice, well actually let me, just let me write it the other way around, for reasons which are becoming clear. Probability times expected values or set of expected values gives us our expectation value. These are expected values, and we'll always get an eigenvalue. We will always get an eigenvalue, but um, there's a certain probability for getting those different eigenvalues. So we get an eigenvalue of the operator, and this, by comparison here, is a probability. And this is something called the Born rule. Just why is it like this in terms of the probabilities? Well, that's a very deep question, but key thing here is that we can draw a comparison between these, these, these aspects of probability theory. So what it tells us is that our probabilities are directly related to those coefficients in our expansion. So we're gonna see that we're gonna do a problem now directly related to this, it's a work problem. And there's a problem very much along these lines also on worksheet four. So you can see how this works.